Schwing, Hwing, Kling, Ein, Saum, Ing, Hwing, Schwing, Kae, Ila, Ring, Asaka, Halla, Ring, Saka, La, Ring, Sao, Ein, Kling, Ring, Schwing, Aum. O Bhavani, Sages and saints describe your gross forms as Kali and others. The Vedas speak about your subtle mantra forms, Kamakala Rupa. Poets adore you as the origin of speech, Shabda Brahman. Philosophers think of you as the root of the worlds, Mula Prakriti. But we devotees think of you as the universal ocean of mercy and compassion, Karuna Rasasagara, and nothing else. Namaste. And welcome to the third episode of our new series, Dasha Mahavidya. So how did these vidyas become established? Well, they become established through the Tantra Shastra. Tantra Shastra are different from ordinary Shastras because they're mostly spoken by Lord Shiva and he speaks them to his beloved consort, Bhavani. And in that mood, that loving mood, he instructs her and answers her questions and her questions are marvelous. If you read any of the tantras, she asks very deep questions for the welfare of the living beings. After all, the living beings are her children. She's the universal mother. So out of her love for them, she asks Shiva, the supreme authority, what are the means for their salvation? And so he speaks the 64 Tantras. According to Tantra Shastra, Kama means sensuality, the basis of which is Kama Sutra of Vyatsyayana in 4th century. In Kama Sutra, 64 erotic postures are described, and each of these postures is related to one of the 64 Tantra Shastras revealed by Shiva to Shakti. Thus, according to Tantra Shastra, everything is related to consciousness, including sexual conjugation. The Tantras argue, when everything is Shiva, why deny or set aside sex alone? I mean, look at all the scriptures. Do any of them say that when you become a sadhu, you should give up eating or sleeping or any of the other activities of ordinary life? Of course not. That <laughs> would be ridiculous. Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita very plainly, when you are a yogi, you neither eat too much nor eat too little. Sleep too much or do not sleep at all. He says, that's not a yogi. A yogi is one who is moderate in all his activities, eating, sleeping, and also sex. Why should we deny sex alone? Well, I have a theory <laughs> that when organized religion came into being, that there were negotiations with the governments of the time, kings, how to keep the people under control. And so the idea of original sin, or the idea of sex as a sin, was developed to keep people down, huh? to keep them from developing their full energy, because the wise know well that if the sex chakra is repressed, all the other chakras are too. It's like turning down the volume uh, while listening to music. All the instruments go down. See? Because why? The sex chakra, the muladhara chakra, is the origin of all bodily energies, kundalini. 
And Kundalini is the goddess within. So religion did two things. First of all, it projected God and goddess externally to be something outside oneself. And secondly, it repressed sexuality, which limited the amount of energy people have available. You notice the elites, the uh, controllers of the society have a different morality. Huh? They have unrestricted sex life because they know that gives them the energy to keep control of the population. So anyway, Tantra goes around all of this. <laughs> And it just says, why repress anything? Because the only way to overcome desire is to experience it fully. I think the curiosity of, oh, what would that be like, you know, <laughs> is a big factor of attraction and uh, people's obsession with sex. So by reducing the curiosity factor, uh, by experiencing these things, one comes to realize very quickly that this is not going to solve my problems. <laughs> this is not even really going to make me happy. In fact, the complications around sex, relationships and so on, are almost a guarantee that it won't make you happy. <laughs> So, by experiencing sex fully, experiencing one's desires without inhibition, one quickly comes to the realization that, hey, sex ain't that great. There has to be something more, something beyond mere sex. And of course, that's spiritual life. Thus, the spiritual path cannot exist independently of the hedonic path. But there should be harmonious integration between the two. Only then the tantrika, tantric student, can attain the pinnacle of spirituality along with material comforts through rightful means. Absolute and perfect integration should be there between material and spiritual life. Without the body, how can we work on our breath and mind to realize Shiva within? So samadhi is attained, at least in the beginning, through the breath. By regulation of the breath and pranayama, one concentrates the mind and also removes the attention from the gross senses and focuses it within. Then from there, there are higher states of samadhi. That's a very mechanical process, but it's a beginning. So without integration, of material and spiritual desires and activities, how can we attain spirituality? Is, you know, are, are flowers sacred, but my loving partner is not? And wait a minute, God or goddess is everywhere in everything. And if we cannot see the relationship between something and the divine, then that something is going to distract us and serve as a focus uh, for the mind, the obsession of the mind, and keep us back from full samadhi, full integration. The life of a tantrika is all about spontaneity. What is spontaneity? The quality of being in the here and now and coming from natural feelings without constraint. This is exactly what Tantra advocates. It is said in the Tantra Shastra, to be spontaneous is to be divine. That goes beyond all notions of ego or separation. An action dictated by the ego can never have the grace of true spontaneity. But this sacred freedom inspired by spiritual intuition and shaped by the discipline of sadhana should never be confused with shallow impulsiveness. In other words, the tantrika has a plan. The tantrika knows I need so much food, not more, not less. I need so much exercise, 
and so on. And that includes sexuality. To eat too much or not enough will impinge on my spiritual abilities. And the same goes with sex. If we have too much, we become enervated. If we have too little, we become frustrated. <laughs> so that the medium, the happy medium, is to find the balance between the two. How much is enough? Simply when the desire goes away, just like when we're eating. When the desire for more food goes away, that's it, we're full. Even if we're enjoying the meal and there's still more food to be had, we should stop right there. Because even if we're not feeling full, in a few minutes we will be. The Tantrika does not have a single unsatisfied or hidden desire as he experiences everything spontaneously through his constant discipline of sadhana. Repression will never take us forward in the spiritual path because the mind fixates on and wanders around the repressions. In that state of mind, divine spontaneity can never be achieved. But there are strict tantric methods through which such repressions are satisfied. Tantra accepts desire as the sole motivating force of the universe and does not advocate renunciation of desires. This is the significant difference between the path of Vedanta, or yoga, and Tantra. So Tantra says, everything is God. Everything is divine. Everything should be accepted and experienced as a part of the sacred reality. See? Not that we deny the sacredness of anything, because it's all Shakti. <laughs> if everything is Shakti, then everything is sacred, including sex. So how do we make, or realize rather, the sacredness of sexuality? We make it an item of worship, just like when we offer food to God. We cook nice food and we make an offering before eating. That way, our food is connected with God. And similarly, before having sex, we make an offering, which in Mahanirvana Tantra is called the five M's. Dasha Mahavidya talks about 10 forms of the same goddess, Parashakti, Apara, Para, and Parapara but with different qualities such as power, delight, beauty, wealth, etc. They are all her various manifestations. Most practices in Dasha Mahavidya fall under the tantric system, but the quality and intensity of the practices vary according to guru lineages. Some follow the left-hand path, some the right-hand path, some use the five M's, Madhya, alcohol, mansa, meat, matsya, fish, mudra, gestures, and maituna, sexual intercourse. So it's not that these five things are bad or wrong. They're simply not in the mode of goodness, sattva guna. So the sattvatas, the Vaishnavas, they restrict these things. In fact, they give them up entirely. Uh, at least in their preaching. <laughs> in their actual lives, this is something else. <laughs> but the real tantrikas see that everything is sacred, and so they don't try to give up anything. Seekers are often threatened with dire consequences if something is done wrongly, even inadvertently. And some gurus talk about secrecy, but that is nothing but egocentrism. Nothing is secret in spirituality. How can there be secrets when Shakti is omnipresent? While worshiping Dasha Mahavidyas, the first criterion is to shed the ego, which is the worst enemy of spiritual pursuits. Para Shakti is both Chit Shakti and Maya Shakti. First, she is to be understood thoroughly and only then one's spiritual journey 
comes to a logical conclusion. So in the sectarian cults, especially the satvatas, there, there are so many uh, terrible consequences to not following the rules and regulations. And of course, they're very strict. Why are they so strict? So that it's impossible for an ordinary person to follow them. And then the gurus can hit them over the head with this, you know, uh, stick of you didn't follow the rules. This is a very common thing. But in Tantra, Tantra says, no, there are no rules. What is indulgence for one person is simply the needed nutrition for another person. Like Bhima in Mahabharata. Bhima could put away easily enough food for 10 people. But that was normal for him. If somebody else tried to do that, it would be overindulgence. But for him, it's normal. Similarly, there are people for whom having sex once a day is an austerity. They need more. And similarly with the other bodily needs. So one has to explore and find out for oneself what is the proper amount. It can't be legislated, you know? Just like love can't be legislated. It can't be uh, told that you must love God. No. <laughs> That's phony. That's egocentric. The guru is taking too much power. The correct path is set up a situation where love of God develops automatically. That's intelligence. So the tantras create a situation where by following the principles, not the rules, the, the principles of do this, do that, Huh? Yama, not Niyama, don't do this, don't do that. Yama is much more effective to establish the conditions whereby the higher states of consciousness can be realized spontaneously. There are different views about the origin of Dasha Mahavidyas, all relating to the Puranas. One of the stories goes like this. Shiva was very angry with his consort Sati when she decided to attend a yajna conducted by her father, Daksha. After this, Shiva was not courting Sati. She got upset and became terribly wrathful, and this anger was reflected in her eyes. As Shiva could not bear to see her wrathful red eyes, he closed his eyes, and when he opened his eyes again, he saw a woman with overwhelming luster. Shiva was scared of her and started running away. To make sure that Shiva could not flee, she manifested or created ten different forms. When Shiva asked that woman, who are they? She said, they are known as Kali, Tara, Sorishi, Bhuvaneshwari, Chinnamasta, Tripura, Bhairavi, Dhumavati, Bhagalamukhi, Matangi, and Kamala. Shiva Purana gives a different version, but what is important is that worship of these ten goddesses leads only to Parashakti, the source of all gods and goddesses, and their allocated powers, and from her proceeds everything else. She is the independent and absolute power of Paramashiva, and it is possible to get liberation by realizing Paramashiva only through her grace. Aum Tatsat, Aum Shaktihi, Aum.